So in chapter 13, um, we're going to talk about uh, building information systems, different methodologies, um, how organizations, different ways that organizations acquire information systems. Okay. One of the major organizational changes that, that different organizations go through is implementing um, a, an IT project, implementing some kind of information system project. Okay? And there's different ways that these projects make change to um, a particular organization, different levels of change. Okay? Um, the, the most basic level of change is called automation, okay? where you're basically taking some kind of manual task and you're automating it in some way. Okay? Um, the next level of change that a, an IS project could create within an organization is called rationalization of um, procedures. This is where you're looking at your existing procedures and you streamline those procedures. You're making changes to them. When you automate processes, particular tasks within an organization, parts of a process, um, it, you, it's possible to find that there are inefficiencies within a whole process when you start to automate things. And so the automation of different tasks can lead to this rationalization of procedures where you go through and you realize this procedure isn't very efficient, so we should make changes to it to make it more efficient. Okay? Uh, rationalization of procedures is a, an organizational change that is found quite often in um, quality management type of, um, of, of projects, continuous quality, um, total quality uh, management and Six Sigma are two different types of quality management um, uh, methodologies that are out there. Um, the next levels of change, business process redesign. Um, business process, it, and if you recall, we've been talking about business processes almost from the first day of class. We, saw, we started talking about business processes within an organization. Um, I believe we started talking about them in chapter one. Okay, so, um, if, and if you recall, when we talked about um, enterprise level systems, um, an organization, um, enterprise resource process um, planning systems, ERP systems, look at an organization as a set of business processes. Okay, so in business process redesign, it's where you're looking at your existing business processes, you're analyzing them, you're simplifying them, you're trying to make them better. All right, um, and some of the things that you can do in BPM include or reorganizing your workflow, combining steps if there's too many steps, or eliminating repetition if there's repetition within a process. Okay. Now, the most, the um, the most, um, the largest, I guess, level of change would be is called a paradigm shift. Okay. Um, and a paradigm shift is where an organization doesn't change parts of a process or doesn't automate tasks, but you're looking at rethinking the way that they do business. Okay. Paradigm shifts don't happen very often and they're very risky. They're, it's a huge amount of change that's done. You're changing the nature of the organization, defining a new business model. You're moving in a brand new direction and you're making the type of change that is going to resonate throughout the organization. Okay? Um, and this um, figure looks at these different levels of change, automation, rationalization, redesign, and paradigm shifts, and looks at the fact that the risk and the return on each one of these, the higher the risk, the higher the return. So with a paradigm shift, extremely high risk, but it's very high returns if it's successful. Okay? Automation, low risk, low return. Okay? So it just lets you know that e at each level, as the risk gets higher, the return also gets higher if you're successful at that level of change. Okay? Business process um, management is a, a, um, a group of tools to, um, and methodologies to help to analyze the business process within an organization. Um, and it's used hand in hand with business process redesign. Um, the steps in BPM including, include identifying the processes for change, um, what processes are out there that we think we want to redesign, um, analyzing what you, your existing processes, what, is, what are we currently doing, designing a new process, um, implementing the new process, and then of course at the end making sure that you are continuously measuring that new process that, to make sure that it is actually an improvement over the old process. Okay. 
Okay. So here we can take a look at um, an existing process. This process is purchasing a book from a physical bookstore, right? The cut, and we have different um, actors, right? The customer goes to the bookstore, searches the shelves, checks to see if a book is available. They find it on the shelves. They purchase the book and take it home. If it's not available, they may go to the clerk. Um, if the clerk doesn't find it, they might inquire about ordering, if they're able to order it. If not, they go to another store. So this just walks through each step in this process of purchasing a book from a physical bookstore. This is a redesi the redesign process where you are purchasing a book online. So um, it's, it's the same outcome, actually purchasing a book from, you know, from a, a book a bookseller, but here we, it's, it's a, a much quicker um, process because there's a lot of steps that have been eliminated. There are stream, there's a streamlining of some of these transactions. Um, so you know, accessing the book bookstore on the online bookstore, searching the catalog, is it available? If it's not, then you go somewhere else. Um, if it is, then you enter your information, and at some point in the future, you receive the book in the mail. Okay, so it's a much more streamlined um, process, but again, the outcome is the same to purchase a book from a bookseller. Okay. Now, there are a lot of tools out there for, um, for um, business process management. Uh, some of the things that these tools do, they identify and document some of your existing processes. So what, what currently, what are the processes we have? Um, creates models of improved processes, uh, creating and enforcing business rules. Um, with every organization, there are going to be certain business rules that have to be implemented um, and making sure that those business rules survive when you make changes to your processes is important. Um, integrating existing systems um, to support these improvements, verifying that the new processes have improved. This is really important. Um, it's, it doesn't do you any good to make these, these process changes only to find out that um, it's not any better than your old process. So you want to make sure that you're measuring after the fact. And then measuring the impact of the change on any of your um, key business uh, performance indicators. So if you have certain metrics, we talked about um, in, uh, in chapter, I believe it was 12, we talked about um, the, the uh, balance scorecard measurement that organizations use to, uh, as a set of metrics that they measure themselves by. Okay, so um, measurement of an organization to determine where they're at in regards to their industry, their competition is important. Okay. So, a little bit about systems development itself. Okay, um, systems development is a, a collection of all of the activities that go into producing an, an information system. Okay, um, your, your book uses a model that has six different uh, phases in it. I've seen less phases, you know, four to five. Okay, the phases include systems analysis, design, programming, testing, conversion, and production and maintenance. Okay, and we're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail. This is just kind of a visual to show you that um, this development process has these six different core um, processes, but it can possibly be an iterative process. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Okay? For systems analysis within an organization, um, in, in a, an IS project, when you're analyzing, you're basically looking at the problem. What is the problem that we need to solve by creating this new system? Um, you're, so you're defining the problem and you have to identify what are the causes of that problem because um, it doesn't, you want to solve the causes to make the problem go away. Um, in the analysis, you're also specifying some alternate solutions. So um, not only are we defining the problem, but we're looking to see what are some alternatives for solving that problem. And then you're identifying inf what they call information requirements. These are, um, I've heard information requirements phrased as user requirements, um, but these are the things, the, these are the important functionality that the system needs to do for the end users. What do they need it to do for them? Okay. 
Um, systems analysis also includes a feasibility study, and there's all different types of feasibility, technical feasibility, financial feasibility, organizational feasibility, behavioral feasibility. Um, but you're basically looking at um, all of these different types of feasibility to find out is this, you know, can we afford this system? Just because we, we think we need it, do we have the assets to set aside to implement the system? Um, is it going? To, is this system going to work well with our organizational culture? Do we have the the supporting infrastructure, um, or do we need to build our infrastructure up in order to implement this system? Right. So you have to identify all of those that different levels of feasibility before you can decide to move forward with the project. Okay. For systems, um, for establishing these information requirements, um, these include things, information like who needs what information, where they need it, when they need it, and how they need it. Okay, so uh, information systems are all about getting inputs, processing those inputs, and making the, the, the output available to users who need that information. Right, so finding out who needs what information and how they need it it delivered to them when they need it delivered to them is important for the analysis of any project. Okay, um, you should define the objectives of the system. What do you want it to do overall, right? And then you have to get into the detail of the actual function. What does the system actually need to do for its end users? Okay, having a bad requirements analysis is one of the main causes for systems failure. Um, you forget some a requirement, you go through the whole process, you have a system and it doesn't meet the needs of the user because you forgot some requirement. Okay, so the systems, the user requirements or the information requirements are extremely important in any system. It's important that the project, um, that the manager of the project and that the project team does a very thorough job in identifying these requirements. System design, this is where you are um, starting to describe the system. Now that we've identified the problem and the different alternatives that we have to, for the, a solution, we've identified the user requirements or the information requirements for the system. Now we're going to get specific about what that system should actually do. Okay? In the system design, you're looking at oh, every part of the system, not just the technological portions of the system, but organizational portions of the system, managerial um, components, okay? End users within, um, within this, this system or within this uh, process, um, the requirements that come from the end users should drive systems development, okay? Um, users should have sufficient control over the design process. Um, Partially be so that they have buy-in, right? If they have input, if the end users have input, they will be more vested in the system and they will have buy-in so that they feel, uh, they'll hopefully um, be better change management at the end. Um, insufficient user involvement in the design of any system is another reason why, system, why systems uh, might fail, okay? Because um, having your systems designers Ask, you know, what is it you want to do? Okay, we're going to go away, we're going to design the system, we're going to come back with the system. End users don't always understand what it is that they need a system to do until they actually work with it, start to see, um, maybe prototypes, start to understand <coughs> and have something to work with. So good methodologies will include the end users not just in the design of the project, but usually throughout the project, particularly in the design of them. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the um, overview of, the, of systems development. You're looking at some of the um, different pieces of that, um, inf information about output and inputs, information you need, database design, user interface processing procedures, control, security, a lot of the information that's needed for um, systems development. Okay, Programming is the next, uh, the next phase in system development. And programming is where um, you are basically taking your system's design and you are turning it into workable code. You're actually building the system based on the design. Okay. Um, 
Testing? Testing is an important phase, and I've seen uh, methodologies that put uh, uh, programming the build and test together. But testing of, um, of the system to make sure that it functions the way you expect it to function is extremely important. Okay? Um, and there's different levels of testing. You can do unit testing. Unit testing is where you're testing pieces of the system or programs individually. Okay? <clears throat> you want to make sure that the pieces work before you put them together as a whole system. System testing should be done to, to look at the whole system and make sure that it's doing what you're expected it, it's expected to do. Um, and then at the end, you have what's called acceptance testing. And acceptance testing is sort of the last bit of testing that's done to make sure that the system is running at the levels you expect it. It's um, putting the output that you expect before you actually put that system into production, before you implement that system and put it into the hands of the users. Okay? Um, and for, for testing, you should um, organizations usually will have some kind of test plan. What, what testing is going to need to be done, right? We're going to do, are we going to do all of these different levels of testing? Okay, and what's the schedule for doing that testing? What happens if we find bugs at these different levels? How do we deal with that and work that into the schedule? Okay. And this is a visual of a, a test plan um, to, that actually records, you know, different changes that are needed within, uh, you know, if you actually find um, you know, find issues. Okay. Then after you test the system, um, you implement the system, and your book calls that conversion. Okay. This is when you're actually moving from the old system to the new system. Okay. And there's four main strategies that are identif that that organizations utilize to move from your old system to your new system. Um, the parallel strategy is where an organization actually uses both systems at the same time. Um, the parallel strategy isn't used very often. It's very expensive. You're running two systems simultaneously. Um, the direct cut over, this is um, the riskiest of all of the, the um, conversion strategies. This is where you cut, turn off one system and turn the other on. Okay, so it's risky because what happens if the new system doesn't work, right? You don't have anything to fall back on. So it's, um, it's very risky. Uh, the pilot is where you are um, implementing the system in small parts of the organization. It could be um, different locations, different departments, okay? But you're sort of rolling out the system in small bits. You're, you're, for a small, for you know, maybe a month, maybe months at a time, just to check and make sure that the system works the way that you expect it to before you start to roll it out to the entire organization. Um, and a phased approach, um, and a phased approach can be done sort of like the pilot study, where you roll it out, you roll out the the the, um, the uh, system in small um, small part to small parts of the organization, or the phase approach can also be done where you're rolling out the whole system to the um, the, si the system to the whole organization, but in stages. So maybe you're giving um, certain functionality to the the organization, but there's you know higher levels of functionality that you're not allowing them to have until you test this you know this basic functionality. And then you start to kind of open up more functionality over time until they have access to the whole system. Okay. Um, these two here are probably um, the two uh, conversion strategies that are the most used. Because um, again, this one's expensive and this one's risky. So uh, the pilot and phased approach tend to be the safest ways of rolling out a system over time. Okay. Um, Conversion it always requires end user training. You, when you move from an old system to a new system, there's got to be training because there's a good chance that the new system is going to change the way that users do their job. Okay. Um, and at conversion, you should have a finalization of the documents that are going to be used in training. The documents that um, that talk about the the system from a technical standpoint for um, possible handoff to IT, the IT department that might be doing the maintenance moving forward, um, as well as for users, different levels of users.
Okay, and then production and maintenance. And this is where the system is actually running. Um, the organization is using the system, um, and it includes maintenance over time. Every, or every IS, or information system, is going to have different levels of maintenance, but it's something that never stops. Okay? Um, and the maintenance could be changes in the hardware, software, documentation, the procedures. Um, you might have to meet new requirements. Maybe there's new information, new reports that you need the system to output. Right? Um, it could be improving the processing efficiency. You might want to make changes to it to, to make it more efficient. Okay? With maintenance, generally about 20% of the of maintenance work that's done is debugging, where you're actually, you know, um, emergency uh, work, you find a, a bug that has to be patched, maybe it's a security bug, something like that. Another 20% are changes to the hardware, the software, changes to the data or the reporting, maybe we have an output report that um, the, the governmental reporting the agency that we're reporting to now requires that we add new information to that report. So now we have to change that report, and that requires changes to the system. Okay? And then the 60, a, big, a good 60% of most maintenance work is user enhancements. Um, additional features that we couldn't cover, we couldn't actually do in the first iteration, so we're implementing those features over time. All right, improving documentation, um, and, and of course making changes for greater efficiency for the system. Okay? But every information system requires maintenance. Um, and when you're looking at the cost of the system, which actually is something we'll talk about in Chapter 14, you're looking at evaluating whether we're going to move forward with the system, you have to take into account that, that total cost of ownership model, which we've talked about before, where you have to look at not just what we're going to be spending on the system, but how, what what it's going to cost to continuously run and maintain that system over time. Okay. So this is an overview of um, systems development. looks at the, the six different activities and uh, gives you kind of a quick description of each activity. Okay. Um, so that, that's, that's a general look at the different, pro the different phases that go into pretty much every um, information systems project. Okay, now we're going to take a look at specific methodologies that organizations utilize for um, for actually creating systems. Okay, and there's two major um, types of methodologies: structured methodologies and object-oriented methodologies. Your structured methodologies; these are um, they're called structured because they're step by step and progressive. Progressive means that each phase builds upon a previous phase. Okay, so you have to get stuff right at the beginning. If you've ever taken a math class where the, the, the first class shows you um, some, some uh, idea and as you move forward the, the problems get harder and harder but they build upon that first main idea. So if you don't get that idea at the beginning, it's much harder to do the work as you move forward. This type of project is that type of project. You have to make sure you get things right at the beginning, the analysis and the design, because you're using that to build as you move forward. Okay? It's process oriented, so it's actually focused a lot on the modeling process or the actions that are done to manipulate the data. Um, in structured methodologies, you are separating the data from the processes. Okay? So if you um, need to make changes to the data, um, it's, it's not going to necessarily affect the processes and vice versa. One of the major tools in um, structured um, methodologies, oh actually in all systems development, is the data flow diagram. The data flow diagram um, is a major tool for representing the system's data and how it moves from one part of the system to another. Um, it offers you a logical, graphical model of the information flow, and you can use high and low level diagrams to look at <coughs> different layers of detail within the system. Okay? Another tool is a data dictionary. Um, and we you might that might sound familiar because when we talked about, I think it was chapter six, we talked about databases, uh, we mentioned data dictionaries. Um, within a system, the data dictionary um, looks at not just the uh, the databases, which is the data stores, but it looks at the the it defines the data flows also. 
Okay. Um, you have process specifications, which is where you're looking at describing the transformation that's occurring at different at the lowest level of the data flow diagram. Um, and you have a structure chart um, where it's a top-down chart that shows different levels at showing each level of the design how those levels relate to other levels and where those levels are in the overall structure of the design. Okay. So this is um, an example data flow diagram. Okay, this is for a mail-in university registration system. Okay, so um, the student who is an external actor of the system um, will request a course. Um, the system is going to verify that that course is available. Um, they will send, you know, they're going to accept or reject the selections. Enroll the student if they're, you know, if they're able to do that. Um, it will, uh, the course enrollment information will go into a course file. Uh, course details are sent to, um, you know, here for enrolling the student. The student details are updated in the master file and at the end of this process, which, um, you know, which you go through for each class, right, um, it's going to confirm the registration and send the student some kind of confirmation. But you'll notice at each level, this is information, this is the information that is all of the, you know, the requested courses um, that the, the student is trying to enroll in. Um, send, you know, sending information that, you know, it's basically you're seeing what information is needed and where it's going from what part of the system it's going to another. Okay. So that's just an example of a, of a simple process um, where you're looking at the, the, the data and how it's flowing within the process. Okay. Um, this is an example of a structure chart. This is a structure chart for a, pay, a payroll system. So you have um, processing payroll and some of the things that processing payroll in, entails including getting inputs, calculating pay, and writing the outputs. So processing payroll is a, is a task that is done and it includes these, three, these other tasks um, that can be broken down. You can kind of see each level how these, um, how these tasks are broken down um, into more and more detail as it goes down. So that's structure. That's just an example of a piece of a structure chart. Um, so that was structured um, structured development. Object-oriented development looks at, um, takes a view of having, um, an op having different objects within the system. Okay, so um, if, you, if we were doing, if we were using object-oriented um, development as a methodology for developing a student registration system, you got a student would be an object, okay? And the student object would have certain characteristics, right? Um, you know, what, what level of student are you? What is your major? What, what classes have you already taken to meet certain prerequisites as you move forward, right? The system, the system here on campus, it checks for prerequisites or do they do that manually? Okay, so it would have all that information. So as you register, it's checking that information, right? And there's certain actions in the registration system that you can do, right? You can add classes, you can drop classes, um, you can, I don't know, can you order parking permits for the registration system or is that separate? No? Okay, that's at Cal, at, um, Cal State, they can do, I think they can do that in that process, right? So there's certain actions that you can do. In an object-oriented system, the student object would have all of those characteristics, that information, plus all of the actions that that, that object can do. As a student object, you can do these certain things, okay? Um, in a regular structured, in a structured methodology, you would separate the information or the data from the things that, that it could do. You don't have these objects that combine um, data as well as um, processes. Okay. Um, Object-oriented um, development is based on this concept of having a class and inheritance. And I'll show you really quickly. Um, this is an example of class and inheritance. Okay. You have an employee within an organization, and there's certain things that every employee has, certain characteristics, right? 
They all have an ID, they all have a name, an address, a date that they were hired, their current position, and their current pay. Okay? Then we have um, certain, uh, certain uh, uh, specifications of different types of employees. So a salaried employee um, would have some kind of, uh, in, in here, they're going to have an annual uh, salary bonus. An hourly em employee will have an overtime rate. A salaried employee doesn't have an overtime rate because you're paid a flat rate no matter how many hours you work, right? A temporary employee, um, you know, they might have information about, you know, a daily rate, how many hours, right? Temporary employees um, in this, here, we don't work them, we don't have, there's, we don't, don't get any overtime, right? So all of these different types of employees have this basic employee information, but they also have not just this information, which they're inheriting from the employee class. They also have certain characteristics that are specific to the type of employee that you are. Okay, so that's, it, that's the kind of the overall idea of class and inheritance. You have these general classes that you can create more um, specialized uh, um, objects based on these general characteristics. They inherit all of this plus their additional special characteristics. Okay. To be honest, on your test, I'm not going to talk to you a whole lot about the specifics of object-oriented um, development. So I, I, if I were you guys, I wouldn't worry too, too much about it. Know about object-oriented and know um, that it's another, it's an alternative type of development. But um, the, the inheritance and class stuff, this is the type of thing that you learn about when, you are, when you're learning about um, systems development. Um, to be a programmer, to be a systems designer or analysis or something. So, um, Object-oriented development is more iterative and incremental than your traditional structured um, development. So in your structured development, you move forward and you never move back. There's no iterations. You're not, um, you're not doing things over and over again. In object-oriented development, you there's this, it, these iterations that happen, okay? Um, and because these objects are reusable, the employee object, the student object, right, a class object, um, because they're, they're reusable, if you're using object-oriented development, um, it can cut, it cut out time and cost over, t you know, it can reduce time and cost of a project, right? Because a lot, um, if you have existing objects that you can pull from previous projects, then you don't have to rebuild, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. Okay. Um, computer aided um, software engineering or CASE, these are tools to automate the development um, of systems and reduce the rep repetitive work. Some of the things that these systems do include, have, they have um, graphics facilities for creating uh, charts and diagrams that are needed for the systems process, um, screen and report generators, um, analysis and checking tools, data dictionaries, code and documentation generators. So they, some of these, these tools can actually generate some of the programming code that you would utilize within the system. Um, and they support iterative design. Okay. These systems are very, these case tools are very powerful. Um, they require um, the organizational um, discipline to make sure that you're using them effectively. It's not the type of thing you just decide you're going to use because it's a very powerful, very expensive tools. Um, you, you really have to have somebody that understands how to use these tools. Um, all, uh, systems out, you know, systems, um, design firms, uh, firms that you would outsource to to create these systems, they utilize these types of tools. Okay? Now, there are other altern there are alternative sy um, systems building methods, and we'll talk about each one of these, the traditional systems lifecycle, prototyping, end user development, um, looking at actual software packages or outsourcing. Okay? The traditional systems life cycle, or um, SDLC, this is the oldest model for building systems. Okay, um, it is a phased approach. It looks at um, 
creating these formal stages for each part, each piece of the project. Um, it follows this idea of a waterfall approach. Okay, it's a structured methodology. It follows this, this waterfall, they, it, it's called the waterfall methodology because once you move from one phase, you never move back to that phase. So once you're out of systems analysis and in design, you don't go back and do anything from systems analysis. Once you're out of design into um, the actual building of the system, you don't go back and reevaluate any of the design. Okay. Um, it maintains this division of labor between the end users and the, um, this, the project team. So there's a, there's a division between the, those two. There's um, less use, generally less user involvement. Okay? Um, it emphasizes these formal specifications and there's a lot of paperwork. It's very document heavy methodology. Um, it's utilized still utilized for very large projects, for projects that are, um, that are mission critical, okay? Um, if you had a, you know, a $5 million ERP project, right? If you recall when we talked about ERP projects, um, these types of projects, you know, are going to usually create change across the organization. Um, and they, they change, and a lot of times they change the way that you do things so that end users have to, have to change how they work to match the system, right? Major levels of organizational change. This type of methodology is probably going to be the methodology that's utilized because it's very formal. You get formal sign-off from the major stakeholders before you move to the next phase. Um, it's very costly and time consuming, right? Because it's very formal. Um, and it can't, it's extremely inflexible. Again, once you move forward in the process, you never move back, okay? Prototyping um, is a, an approach that utilizes, um, it, it's to create parts of the system rapidly to get end user feedback, okay? So you're creating what are called pro, uh, prototypes. Prototypes are these preliminary, they work, but they don't work completely. They do some of the functions so that you can kind of demonstrate the function for end users to get their feedback, okay? Um, once you have an approved prototype, that's sort of the template for the actual system, okay? Um, the steps in prototyping, you're identifying the user requirements, you develop an initial prototype, um, you use that prototype, you're basically showing that prototype to the end users, you refine and enhance the prototype. Okay, so it's at, everything focuses on creating this working, this semi-working prototype to get user feedback. So this is um, a visual of the prototyping process. You identify those requirements, develop a working prototype, you're actually using the prototype. Does the user like it? Yes. No, you're going to revise it and then go back and, so this is iterative right here. You can, you, once you have the prototype, you get user feedback. If they're not satisfied, you take their feedback and you revise it, okay? Some of the advantages, it's a good process to use if there's uncertainty. If the end users are not sure what functionality they need, what the requirements for the system are. Um, it's used a lot for end user um, interface design. So when you're, you can create interfaces and get user feedback is, you know, is, is this the type of interface that you want to work with? Um, prototyping is more likely to fulfill end user requirements because it's working directly with the end users and getting their feedback at every, you know, at, the, at that prototyping phase. Some of the disadvantages, it might gloss over some of the steps. Testing is one of the steps that might be glossed over in this particular, um, this particular process. Um, and it's not going to accommodate large numbers of data or large quantities of data or large um, numbers of users. So this is not the process that you use for large mission critical systems because again, you may gloss over some of the pieces. It's, um, it's not going to uh, be sufficiently rigorous enough to give you the quality of system that you, would need, you might need, okay? End user development is another type of me another methodology. 
in end user development, you're using these fourth generation um, languages and you're allowing the end users to actually develop the systems themselves with little or no um, help from uh, you know, the IT specialist that would actually usually build the system. Um, fourth generation languages, uh, less procedural than your conventional languages. These are some of, um, some of the, the tools that are, you know, you, um, software tools, report generators, query languages, application generators. Um, some of the, the, the functionality you might find in those um, fourth generation languages. Some of the, for end user development, the advantages, you're going to have very quickly completed projects. Um, and a high level, high level of user satisfaction and, and um, involvement because they're the ones creating the system. Some of the disadvantages, um, it's not designed for process intens intensive applications. So again, the mission critical applications, the applications that have a lot of different, type, different processes in them, um, deal with a lot of data, deal with large level of users, it's not going to be appropriate. Um, you're, you can also possibly lose control over the data because you are allowing the end users themselves um, to make changes to it. Um, and end user development has to be managed um, because you're allowing the end users to make changes to the system. It's, it's going to be harder to, uh, for a manager to oversee what's going on. Um, you have to, as a manager, you'd have to establish some quality standards um, hardware, software, and other types of standards that would have to be met. Okay. Application software packages, these are existing packages that are out there. Um, you can save time, you know, kind of save time and money if you can find something that is existing instead of building something from the ground up. Um, a lot of these packages offer a customization of the features. Um, the evaluation criteria for the systems analysis, you still have to do full systems analysis. You have to look at um, what are the functions provided by the package, how flexible is it, is it user friendly, what are the hardware and software resources we need to implement that package, what are the re database requirements, installation and maintenance, documentation, and then of course the vendor, you know, when vendor quality and what is the overall cost, right? So if you if an organization decides to move forward with, with, a, with an application process, they can solicit what's called a request for proposal from vendors that offer, you know, like products. They would basically ask questions, say, here's what we need. Please send us a proposal on what you can, you can provide us and how much it's going to cost. Okay? And then there's outsourcing. Um, there's different levels of outsourcing. When we say outsourcing, outsourcing is sending some level of work outside of the organization. Okay? And the outsourcing that most people think about is called offshoring, where you're actually sending the work overseas. But you can um, outsource things to companies that are you know, domestic companies. Um, you, uh, you can also outsource cloud or software as a service providers, and we talked about this idea of software as a service and cloud providers um, having utility, if you guys remember when we talked about utility computing where you get access to an application using the, and the internet infrastructure um, that somebody else is, mad, is actually maintaining and keeping in the cloud in, through the internet. Some of the advantages of outsourcing, um, it allows you to have flexibility. You, if you outsource, you can get access to technical expertise that you may not have inside your organization. Okay? Um, some of the disadvantages, some outsourcing agreements have hidden costs. Um, and you're opening up your possibly proprietary business processes to a vendor. Right? And if it's a vendor that you're using, it's a, there's a possibility that your competition is using it also. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. Okay. This, this visual takes a look at the different the total cost of offshore um, outsourcing, right? Um, managing the contract, uh, improving development processes, the loss, loss of productivity, any cultural issues, right? If you're outsourcing, um, if you're offshoring, you're sending 
the work to a company that is in another country, right? So you might have um, some cultural issues to have to deal with depending on the, co the country. Um, transition costs, vendor selection, any layoffs and retention, right? Because again, a system could change the way that people do work, possibly um, leading to uh, positions that are no longer, you know, that are no longer available. Another um, methodology is called Rapid Application Development, or RAD. Um, this is creating workable systems in a very short period of time. Some of the techniques in Rapid Application Development include visual programming, um, iterative prototyping of key system elements. So Rapid app Application Development utilizes prototyping as a, a major part of, um, of the process. Um, automation of code generation, um, and it emphasizes close teamwork between the project team and the end users. Okay. One um, tool that is used in um, rapid application development is, are called JAD sessions, or joint application design. Okay. JAD sessions um, bring the users managers, end users, the main stakeholders together with the design team. Sometimes these are half day sessions, sometimes they're whole day. Um, and a lot of times in GI sessions, prototypes are evaluated, so the system team might bring up prototypes of the system, user interfaces that they want to get feedback from the end users and managers on. Okay? Um, Um, one other, another type of, actually there's a couple types, more types we're going to talk about, but another type of uh, methodology that is in use is called Agile Development. Agile Development um, is actually, it's, it's a, fa a phrase that covers a whole list of methodologies, including extreme programming, um, the rainbow methodologies, um, there's a few more that are, that are covered in there. The basic idea behind Agile development, uh, and you can go online and search for the Agile Manifesto, and it actually goes into um, the, the core beliefs and the ideas that every one of the Agile methodologies subscribes to. Okay? But it, um, the, the basic idea behind Agile development is you're focusing on the rapid delivery of working software. You're taking large projects and you're breaking them up into small pieces or sub-projects. Okay? These sub-projects, each one of them is treated as a separate, complete project. So in each of these sub-projects, you're going through all of the six phases. Um, you're completing these sub-projects in short periods of time using a lot of iteration and continuous feedback. Agile methodologies require that you have access to end users. As the project team has access to end users. Okay, it's, um, it's one of the, the major parts of this type of methodology. They like to have face-to-face -face, um, in interaction versus, you know, sending emails, written documents, stuff like that. Okay, so, um, it's, again, agile development, not for, you know, not for every project, not for every project team, um, but it's an alternative that's out there. Then you have component-based development, um, and this is where you have objects that have common functions, um, and they can be combined together to create a system. So you have, um, when we talked about um, software as a service, we talked about web services previously. This is where you're, uh, this is called, when you're using web services, you're using um, uh, these components to create a system. It's called component-based system um, development. Uh, and re if you recall, web services, these are reusable software components. They use XML and open internet standards. Uh, they enable applications to communicate um, with no custom programming. So um, they, are, they are universal, generally more universal. Um, and they can engage other web services for complex transactions, so you can actually use a multiple web services together. Um, and they use platform and device independent standards, um, which means that um, you have possibly more um, 
you have a higher ability to possibly interact with the systems of other organizations because it's not dependent upon a particular platform or device.